It's Monday, October 4th. I'm Scott. I'm Rem. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, the mysterious Electron. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. You know, it might be lame to complain about the weather, but today was perhaps the shittiest day in the history of days. Man, my coworker, the other Scott, he was like all happy with this weather. I was what? like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> but you wanted it to be cold and shitty. I was like, look, we were walking down the street to, on the sidewalk towards the uh, the burger truck. And I'm like, look at that. There's that bike rack usually loaded with bikes. One bike. I'm like, you see that? <laughs> That's bullshit. Kind of rainy, but not actually raining. Kind of cold, but not snowing. It's like so bad. I feel like an old man to complain about the weather. You know, shit, woman. Woman is coming soon. It's almost woman See, time. See, if woman were here, I could go skiing. It's not <laughs> proper woman. This is just like some bitch hanging out. <laughs> some little girls. <laughs> How much for the little girl? But at least we got some uh, South Park coming up. We got some uh, Monster Madness. Oh, uh, Monster Madness, yeah. It's uh, it's good times for uh, for media consumption. Video games are coming. Holidays are coming. What do you mean video games are coming? So Five already came out. There's more video games coming. No, there aren't. Yeah, there are. Why would I care? Yeah, there's the patch for Civ Five. It'll make <laughs> multiplayer work. <laughs> it really doesn't work that well at all. <laughs> no, but there's more games coming. That was so sad. It was like Russian roulette trying to get that game yeah. going. I know, right? But anyway, uh, a couple weeks ago, I haven't talked about this yet because we didn't do a Monday show. I went to the Maker Fair in New York City. You did not go. No, I did not. Luke Burridge also went. Yeah. Uh, your mom went. Yeah, my mom did go, my, literally. Um, you know, there was basically like, I wasn't sure exactly what to expect because this is like a California event. I was like, what's it going to be like in New York City? Are they going to get all these people to show up? You know, are they really going to make the trip like PAX does? I mean, I wasn't too sure about it. But uh, actually, it was way more awesome than I expected, right? I'm not going to go deep on it, but basically, you go in. It's at, it was at the New York uh, Hall of Science in Queens, which I had been to when I was very young with my grandmother. It's over by where the World's Fair was back in the day. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, right, that museum has not changed. There were things, exhibits in that museum that I remember that are unchanged in at least 20 years. <laughs> right? There's a Hall of Mirrors. And there's one of those things you stand in front of it and it leaves colors behind you. And all these same exact science exhibits are still there after all these years unchanged. Oh, my God. Oh, anyway, uh, as for the Maker Fair, right, it had all sorts of stuff going on. First of all, there's a craft fair, totally awesome craft fair. I bought an awesome T-shirt that had robots and castles and knights on it. It's a good shirt, I will admit. All right. Uh, the guy had other good shirts, too. Um but there was all sorts of yarn, and basically there were all sorts of stations where you could learn to knit and or solder. Solder, all right? Uh, I feel like knitting is really, as for nerds, on the upswing. Oh, yeah, it's big time. Way big time. There was some uh, corporate promotion stuff, like Ford had a thing and Martha Stewart Living was there, but those didn't really get that much attention. Uh -huh. Most of the attention was on the homebrewed stuff, you know? Um, the MakerBot guys were there. There were some other people who had, were like professionals that had a had a like a multi thousand dollar machine that did this, you know, the same thing as the MakerBot, only better, but it was much bigger and you know for companies, not for regular people. Uh, you know, all sorts of you know, are all sorts of uh, like hundreds of tables of people who just had some project they made and they were showing it off. You know, uh, one guy had this wooden box that had like. Um, it had various different things on it, like a piece of wood and a piece of metal and a bell. And it basically had these uh, solenoids that would bounce up and hit these various things. And it made music, a lot of different musical things. It was, in fact, like a room of music uh, inside the Science Center. Uh, people from like the Tesla Museum out in Long Island had a little area in nah. there. And basically all outside and all inside the museum, there were just tables every, in every empty space with somebody who was showing off the thing that they made, you know, something that, whether it was electronic or whatnot. I don't think I've ever seen this many Arduinos in one small space in my entire life. Uh, there was also uh, chariot races, which I think we should totally do because we could totally beat all of those guys. I, mean, I was amazed. You said there was a chariot race. You sent me the link. Those are some shitty chintzy chariots. I made better soapbox derby cars. Well, the first when I was that that was the that there were many heats in the chariot races. That was the particular heat that I saw live. There was a great crash. Uh, 
And everyone's chariot broke, except and the, except for the human powered. Were there some invasion. rules we don't know about? Like you can't make it good. I have no idea. But because a lot of those, much like when they I think have make, those, uh, I don't know if there's a rule, but I think making it good is against the spirit of the chariot. Well, kind of like how there's a lot of those those flying machine contests where you try to make the most absurd thing possible, or like the bed races that happen at a lot of local yeah. fairs where you put a bed on rollers and race it down yeah. the street. Man, I was, feel like, however, if it is against the spirit. We should be Team Evil. We should be Evil Team. We could dress up as the Evil Team, the whole thing. <laughs> you know. Anyway, uh, the chariot races were cool. Uh, the guys who do the Coke and Mentos were there, but I didn't watch their shtick because I've seen it on the internet. It was, you know, it was, uh, it was a, a life-sized mousetrap, which is pretty impressive. You can see that on the internet. Supposedly, the last time they ran it, instead of dropping a cage on the mice, they dropped a safe on a car. Yeah, they did. They dropped a safe on a car. I watched that. That seems at least a little wasteful. I'll give him that. Uh, it was an old shitty car that was all busted. <laughs> what it about was, the safe? The safe? Just they kept you reusing the safe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, there was all sorts of, uh, you know, other cool stuff going on there. I can't even, you know, the, the one thing that they were lacking was food vendors, right? There are only a few. So even the shitty hot dog stand had a huge line. And the burger truck that was there, which is one I'd never seen before, had a hugest line. Someone should have driven up there with their fucking food vending truck. They would have made mad bank, yo. Of course, if you'd walked out and go to the street, like right at the edge of the park, there's a ton of shitty restaurants right there. Yeah, that's true. If you want some really bad, like, lunch food, there's food there. It was. <laughs> no, but, you know, Maker Fair, totally worth spending a day at and checking out everything that was going on. Even non-nerdy people would have fun there. In fact, non-nerdy people would have more fun because you would not be... So I feel oh, like I've seen it before. Kids like nerdy kids between the ages of like eight and oh 18. yeah, there were so many kid activities. They had like multiple uh, like stations where you could learn shit if you were a kid and do kid crafts and kid activities. And there were like different labs you could go to. So it was definitely all about kids going on there. So I got a really old news, but I bring it up only because it's so old and therefore slightly more relevant now. Mm -hmm. This is from about a year ago. That's not really news then at all. And it was a it's project old. at MIT called Project Gadar. <laughs> okay. And you, you, this may remind you, remember at RIT, we found that thing online where you submit a small sample of text, and with a surprising degree of accuracy, it would say if a man or woman wrote that text. Mm -hmm. Well, this is that for if you're gay or not. Oh, with text? Uh, yeah, it looks like it actually was a little more oh. advanced than that. The idea, actually, I remember the idea on this is to analyze all the information about someone on social networks and then figure out their sexuality based on that. Mm -hmm. Actually, I remember something. I thought this is what it was going to be about, but I guess not, is that they could tell people's sexualities with a high degree of accuracy based on the gait of their, their walk. The gait of the walk and also a, a, a factor is the length of difference between the uh, index finger and the middle finger. Well, yeah, but I mean, the thing is, I thought that the gaydar would actually just sort of use a, use multiple webcams. Well, like, then it would be the gaydar. And look at, uh, <laughs> it would just look at, you know, it would look at everyone in the vicinity and then provide some sort of heads up display. But see, that's not so useful if you're trying to figure out people on the internet. The reason I bring that's this up. That's true, but you want to figure out people when you're walking around town, like, up. Oh, Homo, homo. Do you really do you need that? Is no, that... but it would just be hilarious, <laughs> especially because it's basically you don't treat it as something I mean, serious. I have a nerve you treat it, detector. It's like a, it's like one of those fart detectors, right? Where it's like you well, hold it near difference. someone's butt and you push the button. And it goes, here's dee, the dee, difference. Dee. The fart. It's like I know fake. who farted. It was Rim. And this is real. I know, but what maybe if you had a real fart detector? How awesome would that be? <laughs> The, the, the reason I bring it up is that I've had numerous arguments with people lately about privacy and the internet and anonymity. And while anonymous is still being very anonymous and doing, you know, it's anonymous thing, I think they attacked the, uh, the European equivalent of the RIAA or something like that just recently. And it's funny that anonymous attacks don't even gather press anymore. Yeah. But people always try to make this argument that you can somehow protect your privacy. And I guess I bring this up for anyone who's having similar arguments recently that it'll probably, within the next few years, because this is an old article, be trivial to figure out way tons of information about someone, even if that person doesn't have a Facebook account or anything, because mentions of them by their friends alone will likely be enough to figure out who they are, where they live, their sexuality, yeah, whether the, or not they the like The only way to be private is to don't say anything and don't be friends with anybody and don't go outside and then nobody will know anything about you. I mean, think of this. If, if you just walk out of your house in the morning, right, on your way to your car, people can see you. 
Well, and if people can see you, they can take your picture and they know your address. If you can do... If they can take your picture and they know your address, they can know your name, and then they can know pretty much everything about you just based on looking at you, but looking even at your then, car, looking a, at your license plate. That required a physical thing. You can go, I think, a much more, I guess, scary to many people tack is the fact that statistical analysis will probably be able to figure out based on, all right, this post was made by this person, this post was made anonymously on an unrelated site but was very likely to have been written by the same person, and this third post has a name, and now we know exactly who it is. Yeah, I mean, it takes so little information to extrapolate a very large amount of information because it's all so associated already. There's no point in fighting it. Instead of trying to eliminate this you know, situation, which is impossible in my opinion— you should instead learn to live with it uh, instead of trying to return well, to no, an ancient time. Well, no, I realized, time. and this is, I had a revelation. I was reading this, and I was thinking about another argument I have had where if you have ubiquitous internet that is effectively untraceable, then organizations like the so-called anonymous could be a lot more powerful. They could exert real influence if they were organized in a mm-hmm. non-directed way. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, analysis like this makes something like Anonymous impossible because if they post more than a couple times, you figure out who they are and now they're fucked. Yeah, you got GPS data. You got so much fucking data. But I realized a way to maintain anonymity. And think about this. Right now, the problem would be, all right, I post on 4chan and I get people to do stuff and I'm part of this thing. But then statistical analysis of the way I write eventually, based on the volume of my post, figures out who I am based on other things I've written in my life. And if your posts in the manner of 4chan or whatever are suffi- like if your persona is indistinguishable from anyone else on 4chan, like if you can have an alter ego. Oh, the ego, only post you ever post is first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure, I can say, all right, we know to a reasonable degree that one of these 40,000 people is that first post guy. Yep. And then you have safety in the crowds again. So coming back to the more practical thing like this, if you're not trying to be some sort of internet future 4chan terrorist, safety in the crowds is the safest way to protect yourself from the fact that you cannot have privacy in the, the modern world. The thing is, okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna seek safety in the crowd on 4chan by basically saying the same kinds of things everyone else is saying. Well, what that means is well, that... They, what's the point of even saying anything if I'm just saying what everyone else is no, saying? No, what it means is that 4chan, or anonymous at least, would evolve over time such that the, who have the large number of people who are posting in it basically have the exact same personality and desires, at least in the context of Anonymous and 4chan. So it's kind of like gods in Dungeons and Dragons. Remember how the gods in D&D are basically are people who are like-minded, they all kind of merge together into one thing that does what all of them individually would have done? Mm, okay. Though so that was at least implied heavily in the uh, re-release of Planescape. All righty. I, I, you know, I, I'm probably the only one who didn't own those stupid boxes <laughs> or read those books, unlike all you nerds. So anyway, I got a news that's related to what I was just discussing about the Maker Fair, and that is at the Maker Fair, they launched a new Arduino, right? Uh, you know, if you don't know already, the Arduino is basically this little, you know, tiny computer that has a USB port and a power connector and a bunch of digital and analog inputs and outputs to make it very easy to create electronic projects of varying shapes and sizes uh, you know, uh, if you're a total nub, you know, you can't make like a DVD player with it, but you can make all sorts of stuff involving LEDs and sound and all, all sorts you of stuff. You could probably control a DVD player with it. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Remote control. Totally. Uh, and it's, you know, you can get all sorts of attachments for it and there's all sorts of companies making stuff for it. So they came out with a new one. It's very similar to the previous one. It's basically a slight upgrade in the memory and that sort of thing with, a, I think, a smaller firmware and some other stuff like that. But the biggest thing they changed was the marketing on it, right? It's now they have, like, cool graphic design. Like, it's the Arduino Uno and the Arduino, I forget, Duo, I think, is the other one. Huh, because I recall back in the day, remember all those, like, box you could buy at Radio Shack that had a bunch of resistors and a breadboard and had projects and taught you about this stuff? Mm-hmm. Those things had very awesome, like, lasers! Check out the awesome stuff kids can do with this thing! Holy crap! No, no, it's there's a, there's a Uno, a Nano, uh... So who is this graphic design marketed at? Like what kind of I don't know, look, it's like a cool it's like an infinity sign with a plus and a minus in it. It's you know, they got it they got a new marketing shit going on. So I think it's I think it's gonna work out for them pretty well here. You know, as opposed to our like the previous marketing was pretty much like it it looked really nerdy. Now it looks like a friendly, fun thing to do. The thing is, as we're probably going to get into in the second half of the show tonight at least, I don't think it's still that friendly to most people. <laughs> 
It's surprisingly friendly. It's actually being used by tons of artists more so than programmer types because programming people and nerds, they just have a computer, a real computer, and they program that. But Arduino is good for people making like, I just want to put lights on this thing. And it's really hard for them to, you know, con you know, control lights on it or make Halloween decorations do stuff. You know, it's hard to do that with a computer that you buy, like, or a Mac or anything like but that. But it's really easy to do with a stepper motor and a couple of gears. Yes, very easy. So. But then you don't need the Arduino. Actually, no, Just, the Arduino makes it easy to program the motor and the gears oh, but I'm saying into a routine. It, it, it is surprisingly easy to make a simple routine happen with just a stepper motor and some gears. I'm talking about stuff like, you know, the guy who's got, like, a, a Halloween thing where his house, like, lights up to, in sync with the music, you know, that kind of That's shit. That's tough, but if you want, like, a skeleton face that pops out every 30 seconds, you don't need an Arduino to do that. No, 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 but, you know, this is, we're talking about You real. need your little brother tied up in a box. We're talking about real business here. <laughs> But anyway, things of the day. I'm going to keep saying it differently every day. Whatever. Uh, so I saw this video on the internet, and I see a lot of videos on the internet. Ah, uh, you do. I see, I see, I you see a lot of videos on the internet. I, I see maybe more videos on the internet than uh, there are drugs being sold in this community. <laughs> but Black Dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this video is like one of the best videos I have seen on the internet in a long time. At least that I can remember. Like, you know, I, you know how I can tell that is even though... By the pixels. Well, no, I can tell. I can tell because uh, of you know remembering. It's like, can I remember anything that was better than this? And not really, because if it was so much better, I would have remembered it, right? So, and this, I'm definitely not going to forget this. So, what this is is a supposed homeless man or a guy pretending to be a homeless man. It's hard to tell, and it doesn't really matter whether he is or he isn't. Well, what he does in this video is he has two Kermit the Frogs. I don't know if they are like. You know, I don't know, they don't have, like, control of the arms and legs. It's just a put-your-hand-in-it kind of Kermit, but it's still a pretty high-quality Kermit the Frogs. And he's got two of them, and he's sitting out in front of a building with his homeless chair and his homeless sign. And he's got the song Under Pressure on a box, but apparently whoever did this video, you know, redubbed the song over it. But I So, kids, for, that's the doom dig doom dig doom doom Doon, doon, digga, doon, digga, doon, doon song, in case you didn't know. Uh, yeah, hopefully they know. I don't think kids know anymore. They might know it as Vanilla Ice. If you don't know this song, just kill yourself. Anyway, <laughs> um, and basically in his left hand, which is your right, is uh, Kermit Mercury. <laughs> and in his right hand, which is your left, is uh, Kermit Bowie, right? And he, he proceeds to have, you know, Kermit Mercury and Kermit Bowie. Uh, rock the fuck out. Rock the house. And this video is just so awesome. And if it actually is a homeless dude, it's uh, it's double awesome. But even if it's not, it doesn't matter. It's still like the greatest. He so. really gets points for how into it he gets. And he gets so, like he one of the comments. The is, one Kermit's like hanging off his off of his neck, singing at you. He the, one of the comments was like, uh, where is it? Uh, it's like he put all he had into that one. <laughs> you know. Well, it also speaks very highly of the power of Muppets. Because these are like the lowest grade of Muppet. They're basically just a hand puppet shaped like a Muppet, right? He is able to put so much perceived emotion into something where all he can do is waggle it, open, and close the mouth. That's <laughs> all he's got. Waggle, open, close. Yep. And I'm feeling Freddy by the end of this. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, this is, uh, this is excellent, excellent internets right here. So, the meta moment, nice and quick. The book club book that we just finished was Ray Bradbury's Golden Apples of the Sun. The next book club book is... Uh, World War Z by Max Brooks. We'll the see. Zombies. We'll see. It's weird because it's like, it's zombies. The guy also wrote the zombie survival guide, right? The expectations based on that information is that this book is going to be just a shallow zombie book. But at the same time, people are saying good things, but those could be shallow people. It is tough to say, but regardless, I picked this book because I believe that people will read it. And after this, I'm going to go back to picking good books. I, it, see, it, I worry. The people who are saying they like it and they want us to read it are the same people who want us to do a goddamn zombie survival guide again. Uh, yeah. We've done, what, like three or four of those things if you real, If you really want one, go read Zombie Survival Guide and World War Z by Max Books. Read a book. <laughs> Max Books? I mean, even reading... Brooks. Reading, <laughs> even reading a zombie book is reading a book. It's not a sports page and not it's not a, a magazine. magazine. So read it. It's all good. It's, you're better than reading nothing.
So this weekend, we will be at the combined double con, New York Comic Con, New York Anime Festival. I'm probably only going to be there Friday because Saturday and Sunday, I'm going to go to 101010, the Burning Wheel convention, which I think is full now. Yeah, so you can't go. Sorry. Unless you're going already. Yeah. Um, That's it. Yeah. Uh, Anything that happens after that, we'll let you know. Uh, Kineticon panel submissions will be opening within a month or so. And we're going to be at PAX East doing at least two panels. We'll probably be at Anime Boston. Possibly three. We will likely be at Anime Boston, but we have not determined what we're doing there yet. No, uh, you know, just and we the will future. very, we will very, very likely be at Magfest. Oh, uh, like, don't. There's no way that I'm gonna miss Magfest. 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 Anyway, all right. All right. So, uh, you know, in light of all this Maker Fair Arduino kind of stuff, right? Uh, you know, I wanted to do some sort of show on electronics, but I am not an electronics expert. I mean, I know more than the average person on the street, but my PVs and my NRTs and all that are not so... <laughs> I have not actually soldered anything to anything else. Oh, no, it's like... See, I'm, that's not even the right... Uh, that's like the ideal gas law, isn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it shows it's like, you know, vehicles, IR, IR whatever. The yeah. last time I wielded a soldering iron for purposes of soldering, was more than three years ago. Yeah, I mean, I've actually got some soldering skills now because I've been putting together some kits, but I'm not capable of, like, designing my own thing. I can just follow the instructions, and I have crafting skills. So to solder something, you just put something together, it's like Legos. I can do that. I haven't built a Rube Goldberg machine or anything in at least a decade. And (laughs) the last project I had that was in any way electronic was when I built a hard DDR pad. Uh And... That was what that project alone I, I hearken back to, and I realized why we need to do this show. It's not so much we can sit here and talk all day about like when to use transistors and why they're cool and like how to make cool stuff, but really, I think people just aren't curious or interested in electronics. And I think that is actually going to really prevent people from doing really awesome stuff. I think so, also. And you know, the thing is, is uh, it's one thing to, you know, when you have electronic stuff that's already put together, like your laptop and your computer and your TV and your DVD player, right? People are really good at using electronic things, but because these things are just built in factories and mass-produced, no one ever actually has to know, you know, how what a resistor is these days. You don't need to know that at all, right? And you can still totally do all this crazy stuff. And because you can, we have software... Right. It's really the invention of software meant that you could now program devices without knowing a single thing about hardware. Remember, computers work on electricity. That is the thing that makes a computer go is electricity. And most people using a computer, they can program ridiculous shit and and harness like the power of God over those electrons. Right. Without even knowing a single thing about the laws of physics and only knowing math. Right. Because we have somehow magically abstracted that completely away from necessary knowledge. Of course, most of those people end up trying to make a game, and then that game will involve some sort of physics, and then they have to learn physics to make their game work. <laughs> okay, maybe. But they don't usually they don't need to know electricity physics. They just need to know like kinematic physics. Yep. And you know that those are laws of motion and, and maybe thermodynamics. But at the same time, people who go that route, that's well and good. But as a kid, I was building very complex burglar alarms for my bedroom because I was bored. <laughs> I uh, I actually, I, you know, I never was really interested in electronics until I went to a summer camp where I took electronics, you know, as nerd summer camp. So I chose electronics as one of my elected science things. And that is where I learned to solder from the Australian guy. And I made, of course, a burglar alarm. And that seems to be the first thing kids make. But it was actually was... pretty cool because in it, you know, I actually learned to make a circuit board, right? They gave you this piece of, you know, a uh, piece of material with copper on one side and you took a, a Sharpie and you drew your circuit on the Sharpie and put a circle where the holes are supposed to be and then you drilled the holes, right? And then they would dip the thing in acid for you overnight because they didn't let you play with the acid. And then they would take it out and you would get, you know, you'd see, oh my God, that's how it's done. Oh shit. And it was like a, it was like a total revelation for me. Ah, see, I, I didn't use And I, I also learned that Sharpie blocks acid. Yeah. <laughs> For a lot of the things that I was doing, what I ended up having to use were not so much circuit boards, but it'd be like for a big Rube Goldberg machine or something, like Science Olympiad in middle school. Mm. So I'd have to like wire up a power bus and then control solenoids and things. And I'd put like one, I'd basically wire together these logic circuits that were just wires connected to each other. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is this is something I still have a problem with, right? Is I know 
basically what a lot or the vast majority of the electronic, the basic fundamental electronic components do, right? I know that a capacitor stores and an oral releases a charge. You know, I know that a resistor resists. Well, I think that's the why real... you know. I know that a that a you know a, a um. I it don't depends know. on what you want to do at that point and what's important because there are two paths where minimal knowledge in either will greatly expand your hobbying abilities. Mm. Because the path I went down with, you know, one path is the, I want to program circuits. I want to do complex things. That's when you have to know, like, what an oscillator is and how to make a simple one. Yeah. How to make, like, an adder and a subtractor out of just, you know. Well, that's getting into computing, right? You don't even need to do that sort of computing. You don't really need gates, you know, unless you're doing, you know, uh, a logic stuff. And usually most people don't at least in modern times if you're like the arduino right you the, it doesn't really have any logic parts on it because you don't need to know about those you just buy a chip you know a microprocessor and then all your logic is inside of that and you write software for it and the only electronics you actually need to know is the you know the input and the output electronics you need to know how to hook up like a temperature sensor to the analog input you know properly yep. you well, need I to guess know how to hook up an led the to arduino the has output. opened up kind of a third path because that path before there were things like arduino that path of doing of implementing fairly simple logic on your own kind of unlocked all sorts of crazy things you could do like it was really easy to take a serial port and have it interact with a physical thing even without an arduino back in the day as long as you could like you could figure out the basics of logic circuitry yeah and you know if before they had a microprocessor that you could just buy you had to make your own logic circuitry and there would be switches like a, a pinball machine is a good example right it's a it's a you know it's an electronic device and everything is done with relays and switches you know, and, you know, the, there's no, the, all the memory is just relays. There's no microprocessor in, a, in an old pinball machine. Yep, but think about the crazy things you can do if you understand logic and you have basic skills. Like, say you're a kid, you're in Science Olympiad, which is always a common thing. And there's always some sort of Rube Goldberg-like event. It may or may not, I'm not admitting to anything, have been really trivial to cheat by setting up a power distribution bus such that the entire device was actually controlled from a centralized location. And the Rube Goldberg aspects of it were totally staged. Yeah. Uh, you know, but and you totally won a bunch of medals with that. <laughs> no one noticed that there were wires going everywhere? Well, for the first year, as an aside... They didn't have any rules against parallel processes, right? Mm. So we had the Rube Goldberg machine just set something up and then wait. And then at the apportioned time, we built a clock out of wood with a pendulum that ticked down exactly two minutes and then hit a button that finished the thing and we won. <laughs> Next year, they're like, no parallel processes. So we hid the parallel process. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. But the tech I really want to focus on, at least for my enjoyment and how I've been able to do things, is the practical electronics knowledge. Not so much building circuits or Arduinos or everything, but knowing things like what constitutes a conductor, what does not conduct, how to insulate against electricity, what a stepper motor is, why you might want to use a stepper motor. <laughs> because even if you have the Arduino skills, if you want to interface with the physical world, if you don't know how to solder and do basic electronic stuff, you're fucked. Well, I mean, the Arduino doesn't do anything unless you know that stuff, right? Because all it is is basically it's a microprocessor that you can load with some, you know, software that's pretty easy to write. And then it has digital inputs, digital outputs, analog inputs, and analog outputs. And that's it. So you need to hook up those inputs and outputs to electronic things that are of your own making, right? Or you can get a book that gives you designs, but, you, you know, what's the point of just following instructions and doing a kit you might as well just you know look at someone else do it you got to actually you know come up with your own new thing or at least try to do something without instructions and then you're actually learning something but i worry that kids just don't have this basic knowledge and i was about to say any more but uh, there's an Ever. article on slash dot about uh the mystification and demystification of electricity uh -huh. back in the day like when we were rolling out electricity to america how people kind of didn't understand it and were afraid of it and how eventually people get used to it. And the article is interesting, but it made me realize that I don't think, you know, the common argument that old mechanics will make is that back in the day, a car was simple and everybody knew how to take apart an engine and put it together because there's a rubber band and like one cylinder. No, and what, it, what back in the day, the mechanic, the stupid mechanic knew how to take apart a car and put it back together. But nobody now, else did. Now the mechanic, right, doesn't, doesn't even understand the car because it's got all the stuff that he doesn't get because oh, he's not. I'm making a much simpler argument. All My right. argument is that the people who decry the fact that increasing complexity and electronics and the things we have today have removed simplicity such that now the average person can't fix their own stuff. I don't think since the Industrial Revolution, the majority of people in America have ever been able to fix their own stuff. I don't think in the, you know, in much of the world, 
People haven't been able to fix their Pioneer own days. stuff. Pioneer days. Pioneer days. People had to fix their own stuff or die trying. Well, I mean, you know, there are some places, if right? In Cuba, like work. in Cuba, there is a huge culture of, you know, making these old cars work because they don't have any new cars there, you yep. know? So the, there are a lot of people there who really know how to fucking make a car work, but the cars they have are old cars. Hey, hey, business idea, because Castro's going to die someday, and eventually, you know, probably in our lifetime, Cuba's going to, we're going to normalize relations. If you want to make a buck, be ready to jump in as soon as it's legal. Grab every goddamn mechanic in Cuba, bring them over here, and make the, like, awesome car shop for every rich person. For every old car. Yeah, every old car. <laughs> <laughs> They're they, not going to be working on your brand new Lamborghini. No, it's not going to happen. Of course, they could probably figure it out. Maybe, but the thing is, they wouldn't figure out anything with a computer on it. Yeah, but I feel it's like the people who complain the most about kids don't know anything today are the people who knew something when they were kids. And most people don't know or care, and I feel like people know about as much about electronics now as they did 80 years well, ago. Well, I think it's also there are people who had a specialized knowledge in the past. Their knowledge got outdated, right? And they complained that something got too complicated where really it was just them not keeping up with the times, right? Or them being unable to keep up with the times. So it's sort of like, you know, they don't know it anymore. I used to know. I used to be an expert on cars, but now cars are too hard and I'm not an expert anymore. But there's some other guy who is. So but it's, it's your problem, not the problem of the car. Thus, I want to present to you Something I like to call the melancholy of the DDR Freaks Hobbyist Forum. All right. Because I wanted to make a hard DDR pad. You know, Dance Dance Revolution. This is before you could buy a hard DDR pad. You could only buy soft ones. And we had a couple soft ones and we'd tape couple, them. A couple. Every few months we had to order a couple. They were, at least they broke. were only like 20 or 30 bucks. Yep. And we duct taped them to the floor and that helped. Right? And then when they'd break, we just duct taped new ones on top of them. And we, we, would op them we would open them up and repair them. And the thing was is that the main part of the DDR pad would not break. The part that was actually a, a basically a bootleg PlayStation controller was perfectly fine. It was the part of the pad, the physicality of it, the actual foot sensing area that would break. It was so shitty. So I had this pile of basically PlayStation 1 controllers with, if I soldered wires onto them, I could make anything a PlayStation controller. Yep. I had a pile of them. And like Scott said, there were no, not only were there no hard DDR pads you could buy, Except for a couple of very boutique things that were very expensive and shitty. Very. You couldn't even buy good soft pads. No, they didn't. You know, not, it's not like today where you can get the like the ignition or whatever, which we have. And I recall thinking, I'm just going to make one. I know how to solder. I got these controllers. I can totally make a hard DDR pad. And I go to DDR Freaks, which I assume is still around. And they had a whole forum thread dedicated to people's hard DDR pad projects. Now, I'm going to skip the whole story. No, but DDR basically, Freaks still around. The people there would put their instructions, like, here is, like, JoJo's instructions for making a hard pad. These instructions had zero chance of success. <laughs> These people did not understand the barest basic minimum of even, like, the simplest electronics. Well, I mean, the thing is, if you already have a PlayStation controller, you don't actually need to know any electronics. All you need to know is, okay, look, the way this thing works is there's a circuit that is completed on this pin, right? And if it's completed on that pin, that pushes the X button. All right. That's so, all there is to it. So, one, these people, they didn't know how to solder, and their explanations for how to solder to these cards to interface with them were disastrous. Absolutely disastrous. I don't think anyone in that forum knew how to solder with a damn. All right. And half the questions were things like, yeah, I soldered together, and now it doesn't work, and they'd post a picture, and it was obvious that they had melted the entire board. <laughs> <laughs> like, they just melted a hole through it. Or their solder blob covered, like, five of the wires. What the fuck? And they'd be like, why doesn't it work? And all the, all the responses would be like, I don't know. It looks like you soldered it. Maybe try buying another one. It must have been broken. When blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and... And one, one of the things, like, I, I've just Dude, electricity out. goes over metal. If the me if that metal is touching the other metal, then the electricity goes over both. Oh, they thought they knew about electricity going over metal. So most of them, the way they suggested that you make the actual, you know, steps where you step, they didn't suggest, like, boundaries, switches, or anything like that. You know, any smart way to do it. Or, or, or even micro switches. Their idea was get two, like, metal plates and cut them to be the right size and just solder the end of one of your long wires to one of them and solder the end of one of your long wires to the other one and then put, like, insulation between the two and cut a hole in the middle. And when you step on it, the two plates will touch and connect the circuit. And then people would connect these dodgy wires with shitty soldering to two aluminum plates and then st and be <laughs> like, yeah, even when I touch the plates directly together, it doesn't work. Yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> and... 
the thing is, this project would be simple. It would take me about a week to make an awesome hard DDR pad today. And Except for the actual physicality of the pad. Actually, that was the easiest part. Uh-huh. Because I have basic woodworking skills. Are you going to make a wooden DDR pad? Uh, it was wooden, but then to get the top... I was, uh, Dude, I, we should make one with wooden arrow, like completely wooden. Yeah. Uh, actually, what I did was I took... You know, I made a base, right? And then over it, I made a frame that was in the right shape. And it had nine holes where each individual like bit would fit. So you put either a button there or a plate there. To make the plates, I bought some thin sheet metal and I pounded it around pieces of wood that were the right size and shape. Mm -hmm. And it looked perfect and it was great. Did it work? It actually worked pretty well. I don't remember you ever actually using this thing. Because I used it when I lived at IBM. And it worked pretty well, but it was too fragile. And every time I moved it, it broke. So I threw it away eventually. Uh Uh-huh. I couldn't, like, literally, I put it in my car, I took it out, and, like, the back just cracked, and three of the soldering points popped off. And I remember just... seeing, like, a few arrows. I don't remember seeing the whole thing. I'll try to find a picture of it. All right. I mean, I used it to play some DDR. Mm. It just, it was too fragile, but my failings were failings of the fact that I didn't have enough money to buy good components. Yeah. But it was amazing to look at all, like, hundreds and hundreds of people who were dedicated to making a hard DDR pad who failed, they had they made beautiful looking pads. They look way better than mine. They failed solely because they did not understand the basics of electricity. Mm-hmm. Let alone electronics. Yeah, right. Yeah. I feel like basic electricity should be required in all schooling, not just in like physics class. Well, maybe what we should do, right? Is I don't want to do like a, like a how something works episode, but I kind of want to like encourage people to learn electricities. So maybe we should like, you know. Uh, like teach the most basic parts of electricity in a humorous fashion, and hopefully then people will go and study it for reals. Because I am an electron. I go if there is something there to go for, but and if- a voltage gradient that pulls me along. That- <laughs> if there is no voltage, I'm sitting my ass still. And then I will only go if there is actually something that is metal. If there's like a piece of rubber, I ain't going that way. It's no I, good. I had an idea. This is kind of a tangent. <laughs> okay. You know how the Anarchist Cookbook, the instructions are kind of dubious? Yeah. Why don't we make instructions that look like they'll make something cool, but really they just make a laden jar and then they zap you? <laughs> 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 you know, you get to kill someone with that, though. You can make a weak one. Uh, the thing is, someone, you know someone's going to be like, Oh, why does it matter what size jar I get? I'll use my tomato jar. That's enough. <laughs> and like, if you use any jar bigger than like an eight ounce can, it's gonna fucking oh, you know, <laughs> it's dangerous shit. I remember when we locked the door to the physics room one day in high school, and just we put the Van de Graaff generator behind it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there was once a, a, high, a teacher of my high school, a science teacher, who picked up the Leyden jar off the table, and he didn't know that it was charged up, and he said it felt like someone hit him in the chest with a hammer. <laughs> He's lucky it wasn't fully charged; he would have been dead. Yeah. 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 But yeah, basically, you know, electricity likes to go. It goes in a circle, right? Uh, you know, well, only if it has a reason to. Yes, if it doesn't have a reason, it won't go. So first you need the electricity to go on the wires, and then you need to direct the electricity to go to the thing you want to go to. You know, every, I think everyone knows that hook of a battery to, like, a light bulb, right? You know? The thing is, I, like, I, I, th- I feel like the way we'd have to do this is even do some videos, because I imagine... Well, there's plenty of videos on the internet that, that are already existing from Make Magazine and many other places. We don't need to make videos. It's redundant. But at the same time, I feel like most kids would look at a micro switch and not really know why there's three spots on it. Uh, really? Yeah, really. I just, I don't know. Tell us. Do you guys know, like, do you guys actually, like, without having to look it up, know how to just, like, wire a micro switch into something? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't think they know how to wire it. Like, make... Do you know what a rheostat is? I don't know what a rheostat is. Really? No. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I guess I use them to, I, I'd make circuits that would go, woo! Alrighty. I don't think my parents liked it when I got into electronics. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other thing is that back in the day, it would be totally chill to make dangerous, like, you know, here, here's some electronic stuff, kid, or that people take shit apart. Nowadays, even the stuff like Lego Mindstorms is in a plastic box. It's sealed shut. The kids don't know what's in there, and they don't never open it either because that's an expensive thing. You're not opening that, you know? And the, even Radio Shack, you know, the chemistry sets and the electronic sets have been severely diminished. And it's only the, you know, Arduino kind of people that are pushing it, you know, back to the way it used to be. But even then, right, a lot of the stuff that you do is because you have this microprocessor there. A lot of the stuff you're doing is in software. Almost no one's doing anything completely in hardware anymore. You know, where you actually have to program by putting, you know, transistors on the things. You don't put down a single logic gate or a single transistor anywhere. 
You know, every almost everything you do is just, you know, the resistors, the capacitors, the input devices, and the output devices. Well, I you feel know, like the best diodes. way to learn is to want to accomplish something very simple where you don't need the logic so much, but you do need the electronic apparatus. Like, yeah. when I made my burglar alarm for my room as a kid, right? First, I made one where if the wires touched... You know, the circuit was completed. The alarm went off. That's basically just a speaker hooked up to a battery. Yeah. <laughs> and that was well and good, but it wasn't that practical. Like, as a kid, I was like, this doesn't really work. It is trivial to defeat this. So I thought really hard, and I figured out how to make one that only tripped when the wire was disconnected. Oh, shit. And figuring that out taught me way more about electronics than I think anything else in my life. It's like a trick. Like, I don't think most people could figure that out. Yeah. Like I got a, a little bit of help because, I, you know, I asked... Uh, th there's this gnome we knew. Basically, he was a gnome. He was like the smartest engineer I've ever met in my life. And he was, just, and him and his wife and his daughter were all like super electronic engineering nerds. And their house was just a sea. It looked like a mad scientist's house. They were awesome people. All right. And I remember I asked him, and he would never answer a direct question because he wanted you to figure it out on your own. Anytime you asked him a question how to do something, he would ask you another question. Oh, shit. <laughs> and I learned a lot from him, and I asked him one, a question or two. I don't remember really what I asked him. And he was like, well, what if you blah, blah, blah? And I was like, huh. And I made an awesome burglar alarm. And the next day when it worked, my mom was like, are you hiding something in your room that you don't want me to know about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. Yeah, I just, I've, see, that's the thing is I've always followed directions on any electronic thing I've made, you know? And I pretty much, you know, only know, you know, so much. Like I know, hey, look, this LED only says it needs this much voltage going in, and I got this much voltage from my battery, my power source. I got to put a resistor in ah, there. Ah, but if you set up something different, you can blow it up. I know. And that could be cool. I think that the most learning in this realm occurs the second you have to go outside of the kit. The mm. moment you have a thing that you made from a kit, and then you say, oh, but I really want it to do this one other thing. What if I... And then you'll figure, you'll learn so much more. Maybe the key is to make kits for kids, right? That will do something cool, but are so close to doing something so much cooler, but you don't tell the kids how to do the thing cooler. Or you even you tell purposefully them they remove a feature? Yeah, but you don't tell them it's a feature. You don't advertise it. It's like you build a, a solenoid thing that will, like, shoot a little... Like, it may, I'm trying to think of a good example. You build a device that will use, like, make a nail hit a bell out of a solenoid, and you can make a little keyboard with it. But if you construct it in the right way, it'll be obvious to a kid that Make if, they, a nail gun. if they tweak it just slightly so, nail gun. Yeah. And then the kid will figure that out, but he won't know how to do it because the book doesn't tell him. He can't ask his dad or his teacher, hey, I want to turn this into a weapon. <laughs> so he'll try to figure it out himself. And the smartest kid he'll is going to have a nail gun. He'll have a Gauss rifle. <laughs> so kids, the secret to making a nail gun, the, the, the gimp, there are two, This is because I figured this out as a kid and this worked really well. First, I was like, all right. If I power the solenoid, it pulls the metal rod in and holds it there. Mm. That's not good. Nope. What if I make a timing circuit that as soon as the nail is in the middle, it turns off the solenoid and then it continues. And it worked okay, but it was kind of gimpy. And then I was like, what if I just use a magnetic pole in the middle so it gets pushed all the way through? And suddenly I was in business. Actually, the way you know I would do it is I would... Um... I would just have it uh, a physical thing, sort of push, you know, like a little hammer, hit the nail, right? And I'd basically leave the magnet uncharged. I would charge up some capacitors, and then I would unleash the capacitors into the magnet at the same time that it hits the nail forward. It, it would hit the... Uh, Scott, here's the problem. Mm -hmm. So the, the nail's coming into the solenoid, right? And because... Well, it's just sort of sitting in there. Yeah, so no, so you hit it, and you energize the solenoid. Yep. The solenoid... And the force of the hitting pull the nail into the center. The solenoid now resists the nail leaving the center for the same reason that it pulled it in. Mm, the th well, you know what else you could do is you could just take a car door lock. Those are wicked powerful. Just use, just <laughs> rip it right out of a car door and use that fucker. No, Scott, this is why you've got to think. I mean, as a kid, you're trying to figure out how can I shoot this nail out with what I have. I have the solenoid. How do I make it shoot out? It always holds it in. And if I turn it off halfway through, it shoots out gimpily. And then what the kid will eventually realize that if you have a magnet being pulled in, north, south, and north, south, you know, south and south always oppose, you'll push the thing all the way through. Mm -hmm. All right. I got the, the idea, I think, stands still. You want to give kids something that is, that does, a kit that does something awesome. It has to actually do something that they care about, they think is cool, like burglar alarm for my room. And you want to just leave just the hint to the smart kids only that, wait a minute, 
I could totally make this into a, a paintball gun instead of a uh, just a burglar alarm. Yeah. I think the thing is, right, is they've already, you know, more recently, all the electronics projects that have been giving to kids are all robot kits, right? Even before Arduino, there's, there is Arduino robot stuff. Is They had, like, you know, basic stamp stuff. There are all these different things you could use to make robots. And the thing is, robots, you would put together the robot following a kit, but you would, you would pretty much do the same thing every time. You hook up a motor, you hook up the wheels... You hook up some lights, maybe. You uh, know, maybe not, an infrared sensor. Not everything's for... like that. I checked. You know what? The the Radio Shack Electronics Learning Lab is basically unchanged from 15 years ago. That's pretty good. It costs the same. I'm looking at it right now. And look at this thing. This thing is not a robot. It is literally just everything you need to make mischief. Oh, shit. And you should get one of those. The thing is, most Radio Shacks probably don't have that in stock. You have to buy that on the internet. You know? Anyway, but yeah, everyone gets these robots to learn electronics. And the thing is, when you get the robot, you basically put it together and then you never modify it. All you do is modify the software because you're programming it to like, okay, robot, look, when you, when you see a wall, then you need to turn around until you don't see a wall anymore with your little sensor. But and that's then, basically just playing with Logo, but in, in Meat Space. Exactly. That's what, but that's what they've been teaching kids as far as electronics go for many years now. Well, part of it is... I, Maybe shop class is more the way to go because I was much more interested in that sort of thing. Like Logo, when I was really little, I was like, I don't care about this. And then in CNC class, I was like, oh, I can program a drill press to drill stuff. Yeah. And suddenly it got really interesting. I actually think the place to do it is art class, right? If you look, most of the people who are doing the exciting stuff with electron, you know, simple home electronics these days are all artists making installations of various things, right? Go around that Maker Faire. What do you see? You see someone making musical things. You see someone making, you know, putting LED lights to blink in a pattern on some clothing. You see... Somebody making some sort of, you know, magic mirror with some, you know, it's uh, almost all art. It's uh, hardly anyone is, you know, making, uh, I mean, there are some people, but they're, you know, is making like video games and other nerdy sorts of things. A lot of it is art and there's like a whole, if you go to like NYU, you're not going to see any Arduinos in the CS department. You're going to see them in the art department where they're making cool interactive shit for people to, you know, play with, you know, making toys, making all these sorts of things. So... I think that we just need to introduce it in the art class and then maybe pe- you know people get interested in it instead of being scared of it cuz they'll view it as they view like a crayon. Ah. Well maybe part of that too is just giving them a some sort of reason to want the end result but no easy way to get to the end result. Mm. The thing is, people follow the path of least resistance, right? You need to, you need to give them ah, some, but at the same time, you need to give them something easy that they will do and find fun to get them interested. And once they're hooked, then you know they can get the challenge for learning. Well, I guess there are two different problems. The first problem is get people who wouldn't otherwise be interested interested, and the second problem is get people who are already interested to become masters, mm-hmm. not professionals. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That was kind of rambly, but. Uh, it's a shitty day, and I'm really tired. Yeah. What do you want from me? People aren't people aren't learning electronic stuff enough, including you know us. So I kind of want to make a DDR pad again. I think I think this time you have one though. Why would you bu- make one? I want a hard one so I can wear my shoes on it and do my double taps. Why don't you just you know? Actually, there's got to be something better you can. make. So here's the, what I wanted to do. I was right? thinking about making a cheating uh, joystick where I could push one button and do a Hadouken. <laughs> <laughs> well. The th- I, what I really wanted to do way back, but I c- obviously could not afford this since I couldn't even afford basic electronics to make a good DDR pad. Mm. I had to scrounge. But what I wanted to do was make a hard DDR pad where everything's metal and the, uh, where you step for the footing is literally just depressed a little bit but solid and have a little laser array in each one that detects... You know, basically, if you step inside, it interrupts the laser and it's a huge reflected laser. So anywhere you step in there is going to work. Even if, and you only have to step in, like, if you lift your foot up, even, like, half a millimeter, you're not detected anymore. You can make a DDR pad. So there's no moving parts. No switches, no moving parts. Yeah. That would actually be really cool. And I kind of have the money to do it, but I'm not going to say I'm going to do it. The thing is, to make make extra steps, you have to clear the lasers, go out and in again. Exactly. So I'd have to make the laser component very low. Hmm. It'd be very, very tiny. Or what I could do is have the lasers go through some sort of Lexan material. So the, you still have a glass-looking step, right? But there's no physical switch. Instead, the lasers are bouncing through the Lexan, and you use whatever kind of Lexan or figure it out to where if the Lexan is compressed by any amount, it disrupts the laser's path. Mm-hmm. That wouldn't be that hard to do at all. 
Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. I haven't I haven't seen any uh anyone on any electronics things using uh anything that involves lasers and you know getting them cut. I've never I haven't seen really? that I haven't seen that part for sale. I, I actually used that a lot in middle school. I got a laser pen like way early because I, I thought it was awesome. And it was awesome for like ten minutes, then I got bored with it. Like what you could did. use is you could use the a Hall effect sensor, right? Which is you know on my my uh, my bike computer, right? There's a magnet on the spoke that spins around. Yep. And there's the Hall effect sensor, which knows when a magnet has passed by, right? Well, you can do that with a, a magnet switch too. Right. So what you what you could do is in the DDR pad, right? You would you basically put a magnet on on the on each square, and you put a Hall effect sensor. And at you when you stepped, the magnet would get closer to the sensor. But at that and point, even if it I got, could just use a capacitive plate to do the same thing. But even if it got a little bit closer to Mo, oh, the capacitive plate, you need to touch it with like skin, right? You can't just touch it with your foot. With well, no, your shoe you could, on. no, because a lot of the way a lot of microphones work is the the air or something moves the thing, and the thing itself is separated by a gap from another thing. Mm-hmm. And that's where the capacitive gap is, not between you and the thing, uh-huh. between the thing and the thing. Aha! Uh-huh. Double thing. Two things. <laughs> So you'd have someone's finger in the in the DDR pad, but, <laughs> and you would step on their finger. But what I would do is, I, we had a, actually that was when it, we got disqualified because we had the chemical reaction where you mix two clear liquids and they turn opaque yellow, and that blocked a laser, which then tripped a circuit, which did something awesome. But the pressure resulting from the reaction exploded the vessel we had put it into and sprayed like lead, mercurial something. What was it? It was lead something. It was bad news, whatever it was. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, what I did is, you know, because yeah, I yeah, di- chemistry nerds, tell me, try to guess what I'll look it up. Guess what reaction I used? Two clear liquids mixed together, almost instantaneously turn opaque, bright yellow. All right. It re- was real. I did it. It involved lead. Uh huh. Anyway, the um, so I bought, I put together so far in terms of electronic stuff. You know, I made that, uh, I made that ice clock, right, which uh-huh. actually worked on the first try. And then I made the Minty Boost yesterday, and it worked on the first try because I'm just so good. But these are all kits following instructions. I ordered one more kit, which is this, um, it's basically a, a mini POV. It's basically LED lights, and you program it to say something, and you wave it around, and it will draw whatever it is that you drew in the air. You know, you know how they do the thing with the bike spokes going around in a circle with the LEDs? It's like that, only you hold it in the air and just wave it. And it, ah. knows, it knows how fast you're waving, I guess with an accelerometer maybe. And it, so it can write things up in the, you can see it on YouTube in action. So I ordered one of those, but I also, I, cause I said, all right, it's enough kit action. I need to make something right. Just for learning purposes. I ordered one of those tiny LCD screens. It's like 16 by two, right? So I can get some outputs and I ordered like a $2 temperature sensor. So I'm going to try to detect the temperature and then write it to a screen and make ah. a, I'll make a thermometer. And then I looked online and there's so many sensors. And I was like, dude, if I buy every sensor they have, I could make like a weather station better than like the expensive ones for like maybe 30 bucks. Get a humidity sensor. I can get all sorts of shit. I can use the, ho- I can use the Hall effect sensor to make an anemometer. Uh, I think that Hall effect sensor, Scott, is an example of you've got a hammer and everything looks like a nail. No, I mean, that's all right. It's the same as like the bike wheel, right? You have a spinning anemometer and I would detect, it would be put a magnet on it and I would know how many times it spun around. That's what it just, there, are, there are many times better ways to go about that sort of thing. Uh, to know how fast something is spinning? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do. Just don't, 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 you don't rely on the Hall effect sensor for everything. Yeah. I'm just saying is they got all these sensors that you can buy and there's plenty enough of them to make to detect all sorts of weather. Like I, I saw a digital uh, barometer I can buy for a few dollars. That's pretty awesome. See, as much as I want to make my hard DDR pad, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to do that anytime soon. <laughs> well, this is something that is very small. It can go on my desk. You know, it is not something that is big and requires a wood shop. It is very good for New York City. And, you know, whereas a DDR pad would be good for the country in the barn. I kind of want to do something with home automation now that I got this apartment. Yeah, the thing is, the things you can buy are so much better than anything you could. Uh... Oh, yeah, but I still kind of, basically, I want to automate the shades going up and down. Yeah, you could just hook up little motors to the shades. It'd be pretty strong, though. And then Yeah, uh, stepper motors. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, just make a remote control, infrared, something like that. Yeah, but then I'd control it because I want to be able to, base, I wanna, my ideal thing is I would have it a temperature sensor. And it would basically figure out if it's too hot or cold when we're out away from home. And it would raise or lower the shades. You could actually sunlight use a solar cell, right? And if, it, if it's getting all charged up, it would lower it down after it charges. Ah. And then, right, when it's, when it, when it's you know, not really, uh, when it's starting to get dark, all right, it would... Uh, uh, Scott, so uh, 
That's actually how old audio compressors worked. With the solar cell? There'd be a light and a photo cell. And the light would get brighter as the sound got louder. And then the photo cell would detect. That's basically how that old shit worked. Oh, that's yeah. Well, there you go. You could totally do that. You want to know how echo chamber, like an echo, like a reverb device used to work? Yeah. It was literally a rack mount device with a bunch of space inside of it and a speaker on one end and a microphone on the other end. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> we are definitely spoiled by our digital world. We are indeed. And you should learn how our digital world works so you aren't a caveman. But you should also know how to goddamn solder. Yes. Solder, eh? Not solder? Solder. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. A bunch. Uh, what are we going to call this bitch? Uh, let me make headphones good. All right. Ooh. Ooh. All right. It's Monday, October 4th. All right. It's Monday, October 4th. I'm Scott. I'm Rem. <laughs> and this is blinking light out the window is annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Scott is easily distracted. <laughs> All right, let's do an, uh, an actual opener.